Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in, that on the cross my burden gladly My soul, my Savior, God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God to thee. How great. On behalf of the Benoski family, I welcome you to this celebration of one of God's most remarkable creations, William Slater Benoski. Like King David, he was a person after God's own heart as he met the leadership challenges of his time. And today you'll hear eulogies and stories and songs from family members, close friends, and others all tied together by their love of this unique force of personality known as husband, father, granddad, friend, brother, and mentor. We welcome all of you here. We know that there are many people from California, 
members of the Norval and Helen Young family and President Andy Benton and others from Pepperdine, regents and staff from the University of Oklahoma, as well as others from our city and other universities. We welcome you for this celebration of William S. Bonoski. Would you bow with me, please? Our Father, you have blessed us with the friendship, companionship, and leadership of one we all know was a special presence among us. Thank you for the many who accepted your son through his messages. And thank you for his leadership of two important educational institutions, Pepperdine and OU. And thank you for blessing him with Gay and four sons and their families. We all grieve his passing, Lord, but we know that he was simply now entered the eternal stage of your kingdom, a kingdom he long awaited. May our celebration of his life comfort his family and all of us who are blessed to share time on earth with him. And through your son we pray, amen. Brendan and Baxter have written a beautiful uh, statement summary of their dad that's uh, in the program that you received. And uh, I know it was rather long, but uh, his life had many things to note. And so we hope that you'll take it with you and to go through it. But as is in that uh, summary, you know that Bill was born in 1936 in Abilene and grew up in Fort Worth. And during his high school days, it became evident that as a man, he was going to be bright, articulate, athletic, and drop-dead handsome. <laughs> when he got to college, he needed every bit of it to attract Gay Barnes, who every boy at Lipscomb wanted also to date. <laughs> 62 years, four sons, and a big family later, it's probably safe to say it was a good match. But Bill quickly learned in junior high, high school, and college, he had uncommon oratory skills. Whether it was debate, preaching, or simply speaking on particular issues, he had the ability to get people's attention, make his points, be understandable, and leave his audience totally impressed. He had the rare gift of charisma. He focused in speech for his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. And in working on his doctorate degree, he was uh, the Sunday preacher min preaching minister at Southgate Church of Christ and eventually dean of students at Pepperdine, all three full-time jobs that he did at the same time. He became the pulpit minister in 2000, of the 2000 member Broadway Church of Christ in 1964, and it one was one of the largest churches of Christ in the world. And he did this at the ripe old age of 28. Earlier at Lipscomb, Bill caught the eye of Norval Young, who had previously been the minister of the Broadway Church for 11 years before moving to a leadership position at Pepperdine. Norval could recognize talent and brought Bill to Pepperdine both before and after Bill and Gay were at Broadway. I enrolled in Lubbock Christian College on a basketball farm out scholarship from Abilene Christian in the fall of 1964, soon after Bill and Gay arrived at Broadway. I can tell you, for a young man from a small town in East Texas who grew up in a 150-member church, I had never, ever heard anybody like Bill Bonoski. He was spellbinding, knowledgeable of scripture, adroit at humor, and looked like a movie star and was effective at convincing people to accept Jesus as their savior and hundreds if not thousands did. Every preacher boy at LCU wanted to be like Bill and they filled his homiletics classes because in Churches of Christ, we had never heard anybody quite like Bill. After five years at Broadway, he returned to Pepperdine where he and Norval joined forces to move the campus from a small section of Los Angeles to the beautiful Malibu Hills with only dreams, a gift of land, and an unquenchable desire to succeed, the two of them bonded to the task, with Bill soon leading the way with the energy 
charisma, and confidence that was required to get individuals who were not alums to see the vision that they together could build at Malibu. It was a huge undertaking that required all that Norval, Helen, Bill, Gay, and all their children who were also enrolled in the task to, to accomplish, but they succeeded. I've been in higher education for, for 40 years, I've been a president now for 34, and I can tell you I have never met anyone who could come close to achieving what Bell led to completion at Malibu. It was just impossible, but they did it. Often accompanying high energy and high achievement motivation in a leader is restlessness, which was certainly one of Bill's characteristics. Soon after the Malibu campus settled into a more consolidating, expanding, growing phase, he was ready to do something else. He had already been involved in politics in California and felt that Oklahoma might, down the road, provide an opportunity for a political conservative, and the University of Oklahoma presidency was open, and three of the people who are here today that were on the regents at that time selected him to be president. After completing my doctorate at UT Austin in 75, Gail and I moved to Pepperdine, where after a short time I became chair of social science, eventually associate vice president, and had the occasion to work with Bill. So in 1978, after he became president of OU, he asked us to join him and Gay there as his chief of staff with the eventual title of vice president for executive affairs. In some ways, at the age of 33, I became for Bill what he had been about the same age for Norval, a point which he occasionally noted and also occasionally noted, 34, he was a president, not a vice president. <laughs> he shared common, we shared common backgrounds. Both our parents were school teachers and administrators and we had similar church backgrounds. We became close in a hurry and much of what I know about higher education and leading an institution, I learned from him. Outside of my family, no one has had more influence on my life than Bill. During that era, I saw Bill develop the first fundraising program at OU, inspire the institution to be great in areas of significance to Oklahoma and build a public support for OU. As he was generating interest in OU and introducing himself to the, st to the state, I heard him speak in about every town of any size, and the response was always the same. Standing ovation, desire to meet him, shake his hand, and in many instances, to get his autograph. He also became a national speaker during that period of time through a speaker's bureau in Washington and for a time of 20 to 25 years, there wasn't a more effective person behind a microphone in the United States than Bill Bonosky. As part of his verbal acuity and intellect, he was also one of the most quotable people I've ever met. Much of it was in bantering humor that most of you know and most of it was a part of sort of an assertive interactive style he honed to a fine science coming out of his early leadership opportunities. Almost from the day he graduated from Lipscomb, he was in a position of authority leading significant numbers of people. And whether it was dean of students at 27 or heading up the Broadway church and its rather mature board of elders at 28, he quickly found the need to establish his leadership among older people, particularly men who often had doubts about anybody his age being in the position he was in. So he developed through somewhat elevated, forceful statements, he would immediately get in charge of any formal conversation or meeting and establish a quick-witted leadership level that few people felt capable of challenging unless they had a real reason to do so. Some thought it was abrupt, but most thought it was smart, impressive, humorous, and charismatic, and it served him well all his life. Our five years together in Oklahoma were incredibly challenging but rewarding. During the early years, he was traveling around the state. He and I had many conversations on the road, in the office, and in between. He was the most unique, interesting, motivated, and most complex person I ever met. He was thoroughly a man of God, but like Jacob, he wrestled with God's will for him and wanted to better understand God himself and humanity in general. I was constantly learning from him in areas far beyond higher education. He was a master teacher and mentor. 
Unfortunately, two serious accidents hindered the level of mobility it always enjoyed. Nevertheless, he focused his mental energy on the remainder, in the remainder of his life into deepening his understanding of God, human existence, and himself, and he earned a master's degree in psychology and even thought about becoming a psychiatrist and then served for four years as a counseling minister at Highland Oaks with his very close friend, Gary Beecham. During that time, I occasionally talked him into teaching courses on the interface of psychology and religion at SMU in our Master's of Liberal Studies program. They instantly filled up and people wanted more. As I mentioned, he was remarkably quotable and to this day, I use some of his pithy, insightful statements. Once in Norman, we were jogging around the OU track. I wanted to stop. He wanted to do one more lap, but I told him to go ahead because I was jogged out. Disgustedly, he retorted, Dr. Turner, you can do anything one more time. <laughs> Which, of course, I did. His move to Dallas to be chairman of Gaylord Broadcasting Company and later to return for him and Gay to retire here provided a wonderful opportunity for their family and all of us. He had many opportunities to express his tremendous pride in his four sons, their, his, their daughter, his daughters-in-law, grandchildren, and even great-grandchildren. And this congregation was blessed that in his last few summers he was willing to co-teach a Bible class with Judge Cooter Hale. As all of you that were in the class will recall, his, letters, his lessons were remarkable. His years of study, his deep faith, his unusual way of organizing and expressing profound ideas while constantly harassing Pete Schinkel, Bobby Skelton, me, or Brad, all in good fun, made them memorable occasions. He wasn't going to teach last summer. Cooter asked if I would try to talk him into doing it one more time. I approached him truthfully saying what everybody in this congregation thought. And that was he had a depth of faith, of life experiences and insight and delivery skill that no one else here could provide. And still, since he still had the energy to do it, he ought to teach again. And I ended that statement by saying, Dr. Bonoski, you can do anything one more time. <laughs> And he smiled and said, I'll think about it. <laughs> As many of you will recall, the last session had to be moved up to the big room upstairs, the summit, with people standing all around the room. We opened double doors where people filled in all behind it because he had made it clear that this was going to be his last class and everybody wanted to hear him. It ended with a prolonged standing ovation and tears from Gail and me and everybody else in there because we knew that a unique era was ending. But what more perfect way to remember Bill than standing behind a podium, expressing spiritual truths as only no one could do it, one who had been touched by the hand of God and to use that ability. St. Augustine said, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds rest with thee. And undoubtedly, Bill has found his rest. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. Watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, come home. You are weary, come 
so I got tasked with this really fun, we really did, but he's done this for a living, so um, <laughs> to talk to you all today, I'm Bill's oldest grandchild, Kendall, um, and of the 15 of us, you would think that he asked me to do this, because I am the oldest, um, but as Gerald has said, that uh, granddaddy has different plans, and I believe that today he had a very different plan with having me up here. Um, I don't particularly love public speaking, especially in an occasion like this, and I can see him right now smiling down, saying, Kendall, this is the test that you were meant to do, and what better way to do it than sitting here talking about me? You know, for everyone that knows my granddaddy well knows that he um, loved to push buttons. He'd find a weakness, he'd engage that weakness to see how you react. So again, you know, jokes on me, I'm here having um, my weaknesses test. As I sat here thinking about what I would say and my granddaddy in general, um, so many words that Gerald also described, came to mind. He was determined and selfless, passionate, supportive, loving, and very stubborn. But ultimately, the word that I kept coming back to over and over again, and Gary even brought it up when I saw him before the service, was my granddaddy was so proud. Every time, from as far back as I can remember, and my granddaddy told me how proud he was of me. Didn't matter that I went to UT instead of OU, how come? <laughs> or that I followed the, my uncle's paths and was a lawyer and chose to teach Pilates instead. <laughs> my granddaddy cared and was proud of things that I did because I was passionate about him and I had a reason behind it and it didn't matter what it was. And without that constant push and encouragement, I truly believe that I wouldn't be the person I am today. And as I stand here looking at my 14 cousins, all of who have followed amazing paths and different paths, I know how proud he is of each and every one of us. And he continue, will continue to be. And Gerald kind of helped me out and laid out the foundation of granddaddy's amazing achievements. And I don't really feel like I need to repeat them again or that I won't be able to get through it. But of all the accomplishments in his lifetime, my granddaddy would always say his biggest accomplishment was this family of everything that he had done, which is a lot. He was most proud of the family that he built and that the legacy he knows that we will carry forward. Granddaddy, we are so grateful for you and thank you for continually pushing us to be our best. We're here today to celebrate the amazing life you had and we are all making a vow to forever make you proud. We love you so very much. Going to the University of Oklahoma with the name William Bonoski, it was very easy to see the legacy he left behind. All I had to do was walk by the library, and yes, Dad, I know where the library on OU campus is. <laughs> but for me, for all the buildings he built, all the trees he planted, the greatest legacy he has, <laughs> says my grandfather, and he was very good at it, I was about 11 or 12 years old in his study and he pulled me aside and he said, son, I know you lost your other grandfather when you were six and he was a really great man. And so I'm gonna be as good a grandfather for both of us and be as much grandfather for me as for him. And I never forgot that. He was one of my biggest supporters. And one of the questions I get asked a lot up in Oklahoma is what, uh, what does Dr. Bonoski feel about having a Catholic priest for a grandson? And I just look at them and I smile. 
he couldn't be prouder. And the last six years of his life, as I studied theology, as I followed my vocation, we grew closer than I could ever imagine. Just hours of conversation, just he and I sitting there in his living room. And I'm sure my poor grandmother having two William Bonoskis discussing theology was probably more than she could handle. But I was just always grateful for just three words, uh, or four words actually, I'm proud of you. And he was proud of all of us. And as Kindle said, he, his legacy is us. He was always proud in each and every one of his grandchildren. I know this because we talked about each and every one of you. And he loved you all dearly. And he wanted nothing more than your happiness. You're his greatest legacy. It's not Pepperdine. It's not what he built at OU. It's all 15 of us. From Kendall, William G., Britton, John, David, Cameron, William Slater III, Elisa, Thalia Claire, Victoria, Meredith, Isabel, Sophia, and jo oh, Wade. Sorry, Wade. <laughs> I'm a bit emotional right now, Wade. But, <laughs> Wade, sorry. Uh, Josh, he loved each and every one of you dearly. And this is what I can say for certainty about my grandfather. Family was always close at his heart. And he had his way of showing it, but he had a unique relationship with each and every one of his grandchildren that was unique to their personality and to his. And while he may have said that all, many of us were his favorites, and all of us believe he was his favorites, we know the two Williams are really the favorite, but I think I can say with absolute certainty, he had 15 favorites, all in their own way, all in a very special way. He was my grandfather. To many of you, he was Dr. Bill Bonoski. To many of you, he was Dollar Bill. But for me, for always and forever, he will be granddaddy until the day I see him again. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God discloses
gay. You were married to a complex, brilliant, ambitious, great man, but you're equally as accomplished. In our home in Evergreen, Colorado, we have 14 large Gay Bonoski paintings on the walls of our home. Three of them she gave us. The other 11 I procured from studio cleanouts through the years. And I'm very proud of every one of them. I first heard of Bill Bonoski when he was the baccalaureate speaker at our graduation at Abilene Christian University in 1964. The 28-year-old wonder boy, and he was amazing. I met him the second time in 1968. I was preaching in Waco at the Columbus Avenue Church of Christ, taking graduate study at Baylor, and our professor walked in one Tuesday afternoon about 1 o'clock, and he said, I want to say one thing before I begin the lecture today, and that is, if any of you have opportunity to be in Dallas this weekend, you need to go hear Dr. William S. Bonoski, who will be speaking on Stimmons Avenue at the mall, the large mall. And if you can be there at 8 o'clock, I'll promise you on Friday night you'll not be disappointed. I called my wife and said, we've got to go to Dallas. We arrived at Market Hall at 6.15. There was a large curtain that descended from the ceiling to the floor of the big banquet hall. We were on the fifth row at a table, and at 8 o'clock p.m., the curtain opened, and here came the director and Dr. William S. Bonoski. As Gerald suggested, he was slam Dunk, good looking. I couldn't believe it. Reeking charisma and intellect and control. I put my hand over on my wife's knee and said, Calm down, honey. It's okay. It's okay. He was riding a crest. He had just debated Anson Mount, the philosopher of Playboy magazine, in the debate over hedonism and Christian ethics. And that night, having grown up in Abilene, Texas, one block from the campus, and having heard all of the great preachers who came through there, I heard someone like I had never, ever heard before. It was absolutely amazing. And I told Deanna, I've got to go meet him. I stood at the base of the platform and reached up. He leaned over and I said, I'm Gary Beach from Waco. He said, and moved on to someone else in his <laughs> indemnable style. I told Deanna, he is an effective speaker, but he has no personal qualities. <laughs> In 1986, we received word that Gay and Bill were moving to Dallas. And I called Phyllis and said, Phyllis, can I have an appointment with Dr. Bonoski? She said, I'll call you back in an hour. She called back and said, he'll meet with you for 30 minutes. Saturday afternoon at 2 o'clock, but he wants you to come to his home in Glen Lakes. And so I was there at 2 o'clock. We visited for about three hours, and the next morning he and Gay were at church. I was so 
thrilled. And it began a wonderful, fabulous friendship. They were there for three or four years and moved to L.A. with the hospital corp. Stayed out there for a few years and came back. And Bill had received his credentials at Pepperdine in counseling, and I procured his services to volunteer his time to come and be our church counselor. He had an office just up the hall from mine, And for the next six years, I saw him virtually every day. I thought he was the greatest man I've ever met. He was unbelievable. He helped more people through counseling. When they moved back that second time, We drove around White Rock Lake looking for a place. He wanted to live at White Rock Lake. And we looked over on Garland Road, and we looked up past the drive by the lake. And finally, he chose a house. I said, Bill, that's an old, that's that's really an old decaying house. Are you sure you're going to buy that? I said, why not the one next door is for sale? It's a nice house. Gary, you have no vision. (laughs) He bought that house, tore out the whole front, had Gay a studio in the back. He had his study out the side where he sat and wrote copious manuscripts. You remember Gerald when he delivered that lecture at Moody Hall? I couldn't believe it. It was fabulous. I said, Bill, that's one of the greatest speeches I've ever heard you give. He said, Gary, you heard the ninth iteration of that speech. I rewrote it nine times. That's Bill Bonoski. He would sit at that long desk in his office overlooking the lake. He'd have a fireplace burning in August, September, it didn't matter. (laughs) And he would write page after page after page after page, toss them aside, and start over again. He was as perfectionistic as anyone could imagine. What a great man. Unbelievable. Dog Hamashold said to the United Nations, The meaning of life can only be defined at death. We have visited in Paris at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. We visited the Acropolis and the great noted leaders of Athens. We have visited the Vatican where the priests are laid to rest. We visited Westminster Abbey where kings and queens and poets are laid to rest. But there is one tomb just outside Jerusalem that defines them all. The stone is rolled away. There is no one there. He is risen. He is risen indeed. It is that tomb that defines what we're doing here today. What shall we say then? This corruptible has to put on incorruption. This mortal has to put on immortality. And then shall come to fruition the saying, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is the victory? The sting of death is sin, but the victory over sin is the incarnate Christ. God be thanked for the victory that's in Jesus. 
What's happening here today is that a good man, not perfect, a saint of God who knew the Lord Jesus Christ has lived a triumphant life and now he's going home to the place that he's preached about forever. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those that are asleep, that you sorrow not as others who have no hope. But if you believe that Jesus was raised, you should know that you will also be raised to live with him forever. Behold, he said, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'm coming back to receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. For in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised first. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of a saint. And here's the setting. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there will be no night there. So let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go now and prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. God bless. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul, my sin.
Dr. William S. Benoski, for the last 60 years or so, was as close to a national celebrity and icon for the Churches of Christ of anyone I know. He was given the gift of vision by God as a very young man to know how vital it was to extend Christ's love to everyone. And he lived a life that modeled the extending of grace to all and how one can be benefited from that grace. He exemplified his values by the love he showed the world for his God, for gay, and his beloved family, and his close friends. He was at his core a gospel preacher. And from the moment he ascended to the pulpit as a teenager, continuing to the publication of his groundbreaking book, the seminal doctoral dissertation, Mirror of a Movement, that chronicled the Stone Campbell movement through the evolution of the ACU lectures, and later to ascend onto platforms with global scholars, queens, kings, presidents, and even Shaws. He never denied his roots. In fact, as Dr. Turner and Dr. Beecham shared, he held the evangelistic fervor until he was taken home to heaven last Sunday evening. You see, I'm a walk-on friend. I'm not a scholarship friend. Dr. Bonoski let me walk on to his friendship. I grew up a fifth generation Church of Christ boy in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the son of a school teacher coach and a school nurse who met at Abilene Christian College. Bill Bonoski was a star to our home. I had never met him until later in my life. And the story in our home of a chance meeting with this bigger-than-life preacher was my father telling how he opened up his public school junior high gymnasium in 1958-59 on a Saturday or Sunday for inter-congregational basketball games. And how then minister at Netherwood Church of Christ in Albuquerque walked up to my dad and said, Hi, I'm Bill Banowski. Thanks for opening the gym. Let's play. And they did. And that story was told many times at our home because of where Bill skyrocketed to after that Albuquerque's chapter, and it became my father's brush with fame. For me, it came to life as a 14-year-old boy later who looked forward to receiving my copy of Sports Illustrated each week, having been given a subscription for my birthday the year before. And on the week of May 23rd, 1977, I took my magazine from the family mail stack my mom brought in, and on the cover were two dominant pro basketball players, both of them great legends from the wooden UCLA era. Bill Walton and Kareem Jabbar fighting it out as pros. And while that was wonderful, I would learn later that Dr. Bonoski knew both of them personally. However, for me, it was not the cover. It was as I turned to page 100, and in there was a spread on Pepperdine University. This was huge. And then you turn the page, and there is Dr. Bonoski with his hand stretched out over the Malibu miracle atop the perch of what is now the Brock House, the president's home. For me, that was unbelievable because Bill Bonoski was one of us, and there he was in a national magazine, and I'll never forget the feeling I had when I saw that. Little did I know that I would have the blessing of knowing Dr. Bonoski later, and he would become a continuing motif in my life because while I haven't been in higher education for 40 years, Dr. Turner gave me a certificate the other day for about half of that, and it all started at Abilene Christian with Vice President Bob Hunter, who encouraged President Bill Teague for me to be his assistant. Then I went to Pepperdine, and I worked directly with David Davenport, President Davenport, as his assistant, and Andy Benton, who's here today, as his vice president. And I've been 20 years with President Turner. And I can tell you that Bill Bonoski 
influenced every one of these leaders I've mentioned. I am from that tree, and I have had the privilege of having a personal relationship with Bill and Gay, and I am so grateful for that. He became a friend, professor, spiritual guidance counselor, a speech coach, and he's grading me right now, and he would like it to be shortened. I know what time we're ending this, Baxter. <laughs> one, one, one story I do want to share, though, is when President, T T President Teague sent me to Dallas to Gaylord Broadcasting for my first meeting with, with, Mr. Uh, with Dr. Bonoski. I walked into the office. I was so nervous. President Teague couldn't go. And I was meeting with former mayor of Dallas, Jack Evans, and Bill Bonoski. It didn't get bigger than this for me. I'd never met either one of them. I was representing him. I sat down and I had brought the materials from Abilene Christian for a fundraising project. I was to lay it out, bring back the messages to President Teague, and hope it went well. I went in there. I kind of laid it out very nervously. It was a little silent. Things didn't go so well, in my opinion. And all of a sudden, Dr. Bonoski goes, here's what we're going to do. He took a yellow pad. He wrote down pyramids. He wrote down messages. He showed what we were going to do, and I was mesmerized. I mean mesmerized, and so was Mayor Evans. We didn't say a thing. And when Mayor Evans came out of his trance, and I did too, he said, Bill, I'm in it if you are. And he said, Brad, go back to Abilene and tell Bill Teague you've got a committee of two and growing and a project. I went, yes, sir. I went back to Abilene. <laughs> Bill was probably the best higher education fundraiser I've ever known, only rivaled by Gerald Turner. But probably the most meaningful chapter of my relationship with him has been the years that we have had the privilege, Angela and I and our three boys, to be with Bill and Gay at this church. He has been a mentor, a preacher, and an encourager to so many of us. And I recall when I was asked to consider being an elder, I talked to Bill about that. And Bill said, he said, Brad, given my experience as a beat up preacher in the churches of Christ, I don't really like elders. <laughs> <laughs> he said, but he said, I like Mike Boone and Cooter Hale. So he said, I think you, you, you should do it. And so me, I, I, and along with Dan Branch and Paul Hurd and others, joined in that class of elders, and we have not regretted it. And one day in the, in the prayer room, he walked by, and he said, Brad, I love the elders here, and I was alone. And he said, uh, he said and you're my favorite. And I thought, wow, that's awesome. Sounds like a grandkid story. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because then I think Dan came down and said, you're never going to believe Bill Bonoski just walked by. He said he loves the elders, and he said, I'm his favorite. <laughs> but in fact, I think we were all his favorite, which is why I want to share with you why I was a walk-on. March 4th, I was given the opportunity to be with Bill's closest circle of friends here in Dallas, his confidants, his scholarship friends, Gary Beecham, Gerald Turner, and Pete Schenkel. Bill had asked Pete to extend invitations to all of us for his 83rd birthday lunch at the beautiful formal dining room of their new home at the Tradition here in Dallas. And I was honored to be included, so honored. And as we walked up to the corner round table of the Tradition's dining room, I said to Bill as I was walking next to him, I said, Bill, this reminds me of the corner table at Los Angeles Country Club where Margaret Brock would entertain you for lunch. And then later, uh, law students like my brother and I who were Brock scholars, he said, oh, Brad, this lunch is going to be a lot more fun than those. <laughs> and they were. The, every word and every story, I'll cherish that day for the rest of my life. And he felt great and he looked great. And we had a great time. And thank you, Gay and family, for sharing him with all of us. He has blessed all of us for generations to come. And I'm so grateful God gave him to us. Baxter and the family asked that I close with this reading.
from 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet in inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Bill kept his eye on what is unseen and eternal. Will you bow with me? Thank you, God, for seeing fit to bless all of us with the life well lived of Bill Bonoski. He loved us and we loved him. Please comfort his best friend and partner, Gay, and his beloved family. Guide us to always show love, the love of Christ to all, just as Bill did. And in your son's name that we pray, amen. Our last hymn is Walking Alone at Eve. I feel a little meager giving you the history of this with Jerry Rushford in the room. But this hymn was arranged and the tune was written and composed by William Washington Slater, Will Slater, in 1917. Will Slater was born in Arkansas and moved to what was then known as Indian Territory as a young boy, later the state of Oklahoma. He began his life as a gospel preacher in Shiloh, Oklahoma. He was the father of Thelma Slater Bonoski, who was the mother of our own Bill Bonoski. And how appropriate that we close with this hymn by Bill's grandfather. Literally, the DNA of a gospel preacher ran through his entire fiber, and he blessed us with his life. And so at this time, I'd ask that you stand while the family will depart during this song to the private burial that follows. Walking alone at Eve and viewing the skies afar, Bidding the darkness come to welcome me, silver star. I have a great delight in the wonderful scenes above. God in his power and might is showing his truth and love. Oh, for a home with God, a oh, place in his foot to rest. Surely a safe abode with Jesus and the blessed. Rest for a weary soul, once redeemed by the Savior's love. When I get pure and whole, and live with my God above, sitting alone at eve, and dreaming the hours away, watching the shadows falling, now at the close of day. God in his mercy comes with his word he is drawing near, spreading his love and truth around me and everywhere. Oh, for a home with God, a place in his foot to rest, surely a safe abode with Jesus and the blessed. Rest for a weary soul redeemed by the Savior's love, where I'll be pure and whole and live with my God above. Closing my eyes at eve and thinking of heaven's grace, longing to see my Lord, yes, meeting Him face to face, trusting Him as my all, wheresoever my footsteps roam. Leading with him to guide me onto the Spirit's home. Oh, for a home with God, a place in his courts to rest. Surely a safe abode with Jesus and the blessed. Rest for a weary soul, once redeemed by the Savior's love. Where I'll be pure and whole and live with my God above.
thank you for being here and honoring Bill's memory and comforting the Banoski family. We are dismissed.